In this video, I will show the Heathkit GC1A Mohican. This is a shortwave radio receiver suitable for shortwave listening or amateur radio use. It receives frequencies from the AM broadcast band up to 32 megahertz over five bands. The name follows the convention of some early Heathkit products that were named after Native American Indian tribes. It was offered from 1962 through 1968 and apparently for a few years after that even though it did not appear in catalogs after 1968. It was the successor to the GC1 that was offered from 1960 to through 1962 and it was almost the same except for a few circuit changes. The US list price was $89.50 although it was slightly higher when first offered. This is an advertisement from a Canadian Heathkit catalog with Canadian prices. It was a kit and it was estimated that experienced kit builders could assemble it within 30 hours. An assembled version was offered as well at a higher price. It is portable, running on battery power using eight C cells. Battery life was estimated as up to 400 hours of intermittent service. An optional AC power supply was offered for $9.95. Most users probably opted to buy the optional power supply. It has an internal speaker and a built-in 54-inch extendable antenna. The receiver weighs 18 pounds less batteries. The GC1 was the first fully transistorized shortwave receiver offered by Heathkit, and according to Heathkit author Chuck Penson, the first commercial all-solid-state shortwave receiver ever on the market. Shortwave and amateur radio receivers are usually distinguished by the fact that shortwave receivers provide general coverage, usually from the AM broadcast band up to about 30 megahertz, and amateur radio receivers support just the ham bands. A general coverage receiver is usually not suitable for ham radio use because the ham bands are crowded into small portions of the tuning dial. The GC1A solves this using the band spread approach where a second tuning knob and dial is used to expand the ham bands. The GC1A offers calibrated band spread for the 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter amateur bands and 11 meter citizens band which had earlier been a ham band. The radio has a large 54 inch telescoping antenna which is much too large to be shown extended here. It can also use an external antenna. It features the standard Heathkit green color and polished chrome knobs. A carrying handle is provided. The handle can be mounted on the top or on the right side. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. At top left is an S meter which indicates received signal strength on a scale from 0 to 10. There's a switch for automatic volume control. It's normally turned on for AM signals and off for single sideband and CW reception. The dial has the pointer for the five general coverage bands at the top and a separate dial for band spread at the bottom. To use the band spread, you need to align the top dial with a mark for the appropriate band and then use the band spread tuning knob. For example, for 40 meters, we align to this mark and then can use the band spread calibration on the lower dial here. When not using the band spread, it should be aligned to the right side of the dial. At bottom left is the main tuning knob. A weighted flywheel inside gives the tuning a nice feel. Next is power and volume control. Then the BFO used for tuning CW and sideband signals. The BFO is switched on and off by pressing it in and out. Next is the band switch, selecting one of five bands. Then we have RF gain and an antenna tuning control. The large knob on the right is the band spread tuning. The switches are for the automatic noise limiter which was simple and typical of this vintage of receiver and not particularly effective. The dial light switch turns on the dial lamp when on. This is a momentary switch to conserve battery life. When running on AC power, the dial lamps are at half brightness all the time. Now let's look at the rear panel. At the top 
is either a battery pack or the AC power supply. You can switch between them without needing tools. This one has the AC power supply installed. I don't have a battery pack. This is the external antenna connection, a muting connection, and a quarter inch headphone jack. Muting is used to disable the receiver when it's being used with a ham radio transmitter when it's typically connected to a transmit receiver relay. Here it's jumper to always be on as I'm not using it with a transmitter. Let's take a look at the insides. The circuit uses 10 transistors and 6 diodes and is a single conversion superhet with a 455 kilohertz IF frequency. It uses fixed pre-aligned ceramic IF trans filters. The sensitivity is rated at 10 microvolts on the AM broadcast band and 2 microvolts on short wave. It uses a mixture of printed circuit boards and point-to-point -point wiring. You can see the alignment coils and trimmer caps. The alignment procedure is quite lengthy. You need to adjust 30 caps and coils for a total of 5 bands. Getting the dial calibration correct is an iterative process and you also have to watch out for image frequencies due to the low IF. Owners who experienced poor sensitivity or dial calibration likely didn't properly align the receiver. An RF signal generator is needed to align it. Here's a look at the underside of the chassis which has mostly point-to-point -point wiring. And here is the AC power supply which was very simple. Okay, let's give the radio a little on-air test. I'm going to move across the 4 to 9 megahertz band and see what signals we can pick up. I'm using an external antenna and it's early evening here in Ottawa, Canada. So I thought I would mention a few of the quirks and miscellaneous info about this radio. Transistors were brand new when the GC1 was introduced. The manual actually includes a section that covers the theory of operation of transistors because they were so new. It uses germanium transistors on sockets. It's hard to find replacements for these as they're no longer manufactured. You may be able to use silicon transistors as replacements but uh, would probably have to make some minor circuit changes. Fortunately, all the transistors were good in my unit. Few of the surviving units still seem to have the battery packs. Apparently, almost everyone bought the optional power supply, and most people lost the battery packs years ago. Some people have made a battery pack themselves, or you could use an external 12-volt power supply. I found a partial manual with alignment instructions on the Internet, and noticed they were different from the instructions in my copy of the full manual, uh, it seems that the alignment procedure is different for the UK versus the North American versions. So this is something to watch out for. In summary, the major strengths of the Mohican are portable operation, where portable really means you can lug it to the cottage and run it on batteries. It's self-contained with a built-in speaker and antenna. It provided general coverage of shortwave and band spread for ham bands. Realistically, this could be used as a backup receiver, but probably not as the primary one for a serious ham radio operator. It receives AM broadcast bands and has pretty good sensitivity with support for receiving CW or Morse code and single sideband signals. Its main weaknesses are that by today's standards, it's pretty big, heavy, and the band spread dial is not particularly accurate on the ham bands. Author Chuck Penson wrote in his Heathkit book, that he feels this is the best shortwave receiver ever offered by Heathkit. It is significant in that it was the first all solid state shortwave receiver offered. 
and shows that Heathkit was at the forefront of technology. A large number of them were sold and many units like this one still survive and are in working order.